I read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics when I was in my early 20s. Lots of good stuff in it, obviously. My favorite part was Book 7. It straightened me out in at least five ways. And this video takes a look at my views pre and post, starting where they would agree. Everyone agrees that a good life should be both virtuous and fun. Number two, self-control is good. It's morally good. It's more desirable, more attractive, more convenient, much less expensive, having self-control better than the other option. And I'm not saying that before I read the book I had zero self-control and that afterwards I had perfect self-control or that self-control is the one key to living a good life. And I'm not blaming anyone for not having self. I'm just saying that we can hopefully agree on these two points. And we'll come back to virtue and pleasure later. First, though, the disagreements. Number one, is it better to have a mild temperament or to have self-restraint? Then on the other side of the spectrum, is it better to be profligate, which is debauched or wicked? Is that better than lacking self-restraint? Is it better to lack self-restraint or be volatile, hot-tempered? Is it better to be clever or prudent? Not straightforward questions, and since we're talking about virtue here, let's contrast it with some vice. I'll pick a fake, silly example like staying up late and eating candy and watching cartoons. You could pick your own. A mild person, we're stretching analogies here, but we'll say a mild person doesn't even like candy or cartoons or anything. Mr. Milk Toast, timid, feeble, bland. And this is not necessarily the most admirable person you know. That person would be passionate and good and naturally seeking out the right best things. Mr. Milk Toast isn't that. But the point is, neither am I. And if you're not going to let me have any fun anyway, then at least we could take away the desire for the candy and the cartoons. I used to spend a lot of time wishing there were fewer desirable things in the world so they'd be easier to avoid. Instead, I'm supposed to study for this test, but I know that my favorite cartoons are on television. Or, since I'm going to end up watching them anyway, at least I could do it without this nagging, annoying conscience. Because I watch the cartoons instead of studying, and then I get to class and I'm feeling a little ashamed or at least disappointed in myself. Then I get there, and these two guys are laughing and joking and bragging because they did the same thing. They watched the same cartoon marathon. No way I'm missing that. And part of me wants to join in, but I really can't because I'm annoyed. I don't want to scold them like Mr. Milk Toast. That's not the end of the world. It's not a horrible crime. But the point is, I plan to study. That's what's annoying. I plan to do one thing, then ended up doing the other. Was that lack of willpower? Do I just not know myself? Anyway, one person studied and did well. Other people didn't study, but at least they enjoyed themselves. What did I get? At least I didn't lose my head, because like later in the cafeteria, Mr. Milk Toast doesn't know what to do. They didn't have his favorite cheese sandwich, and he totally lost his head. The other two friends, they almost started a fight because somebody else was at their regular table. Maybe I lack perfect self-control, but at least I'm not a hothead. At least I'm not going to embarrass myself over something like that. I get by well enough because I'm clever enough. I have this practical knowledge that I could use in the cafeteria or the classroom or at home. Yeah, I could have done better, but I'll still pass the class. Cleverness is adaptable. Prudence doesn't let you have any fun at all, even when you can get away with it. And if you're clever enough, you can get away with it most of the time. Well, that's how I felt before reading the Nicomachean Ethics, especially Book 7. But I also, I'd have to admit that there was something attractive about people who could dedicate themselves to a cause or something and stick with it. And there is something attractive about people who are quick to defend their honor against any insults, real or imagined. I used to really pride myself on not losing my temper, but sometimes you should lose your temper or at least act. And I have to admit also that there is something missing in a life that either values silly things too much or not at all. But finding a middle path and walking it, that's easier said than done. So I had these clues that my thinking was incomplete. Aristotle helped crystallize what was missing. According to the philosopher, the self-restrained person is more admirable than the unfeeling. Two students walk past the dessert tray. Both decline. One doesn't even care. They're probably all terrible anyway. The other thinks they look delicious, but uses reason. Makes a conscious choice to stick with his or her health and fitness goals. That is good. That's better. Because everyone needs food, and it's right to be attracted to good-tasting, nutritious food. Some foods should attract us. 
the desire for food doesn't need to be repressed, just directed appropriately. Again, everyone agrees that self-control is superior to lacking self-control, but the profligate is even less enviable than that. The unrestrained person may have ended up watching cartoons, but at least he planned to study. At least he cared about what the right thing to do was. Desire gets the best of everyone at some point, but it is better to be led astray by some strong emotion than just to plan to do the less noble thing from the beginning. That's why the punishment for second-degree murder is less severe than the punishment for first-degree murder. Lack of premeditation also lessens the culpability for the volatile, hot-headed reaction. Reflexes are not conscious actions. Deciding to do one thing and then caving in to the opposite is... Well, it's one of the problems of being clever. Cleverness is a useful tool, but it can get you into as much trouble as it gets you out of. Prudence, on the other hand, means both knowing the right thing and doing the right thing. Which, according to Aristotle, is your best bet in the long run, even if you're clever and you could make up excuses for anything you wanted to do. Which brings us back to virtue and pleasure. One approach is to view them as opposed. The more virtue you have, the less pleasure and vice versa. Choose your path and stay with it. But that can't be all there is because neither of these paths seems to be the most admirable life. Maybe virtue is like a muscle that needs to be trained and strengthened. When it's strong enough and you're good enough, pleasure comes as your reward. No, says Aristotle. Virtues are habits, not muscles. Objectively good habits. Habits. Habits become natures, and pleasure is not a reward or a destination, but an activity. The activity done by nature. Shipbuilders build ships and are happy. As shipbuilders, they are happy when building good ships. And of course, reading that chapter and liking it, maybe even understanding it a little, all that stuff does not make doing the right thing easy. It might, however, have made it a little bit easier Easier for me to work towards being that better version of myself when I realized that I didn't have to give up anything I liked in order to get something I wanted. I just had to value something else strongly enough to like it.